Okay, <laughs> now, tonight. Um, this program happened because Sunny and I happened to run into Brad Baumgartner, who is our speaker, while we were looking for sawwet owls that had been reported at the Memorial Cemetery in Skokie in the winter. <laughs> I was trying to figure out why Brad had driven several hours from Indiana to see sawwet owls in the northern suburbs. And that's when I discovered that he'd been studying sawwet owls at the Indian Dunes National Park for over 10 years. I'd been meaning to invite him to speak to us for a long time about birding in Indiana, but this program fell in my lap. Everyone owl, loves owls, so here we are. Um, Brad Baumgartner is the executive director for Illinois for Indiana Audubon, and he chairs the annual D Indiana Birds, uh, Indiana Dunes Birding Festival, which I'm sure some of you have been to. He has a bachelor's in science from Purdue and holds a master banding permit from the United States Ge Geological, I don't know what's wrong with me tonight, I'm tired, United States Geological Survey, and he also <laughs> coordinates peregrine falcon banding for northern Indiana. So thank you, Brad, for agreeing to Join us and take it away. Hey, no problem. Uh, great to be here. I'm going to see if I can uh, do this here real quick without my screen freezing on me like it occasionally does. And hey, I think I'm still on. good. Still, still see me. Great. So, yeah, thanks for having me. As you mentioned, I am the executive director for Indiana Audubon, which is, uh, it, it's kind of weird hearing you guys talk because we, both of us, whether you're in Illinois or Indiana, you talk about IAS. So it's like <laughs> society, real Illinois really Audubon Society, but uh, I've been fortunate to be the executive director for Indiana Audubon Society, our IAS, for about uh, three or four years now. And uh, this is something though specifically that I have been involved in, as she mentioned, for 10 years uh, from my time that I used to work for the Indiana DNR at the Indiana Dune State Park. And you talk about, you know, is this really a relevant topic for this particular month? Well, you know, I think owls are a year round pleasure. And uh, specifically looking at the Solway, I mean, literally about eight or nine months of the year, the one could be around in your backyard uh, here. So they definitely are a wintering bird, as you referenced earlier, um, a, a migrant, particularly we study them most in the fall, but there is a spring migration as well. So there's a lot really to think about and, and one of my pleasures and joys in, the same as being like a program. and ornithology is to uh, some of these really cool aspects of migration, just being able to study those in depth. And so that's why I, I feel like I've been really blessed that uh, you were just reading some of the cool things I get to do. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's a lot of fun as well. And, and owls, I think are definitely been my favorite and something that I'm just obsessed with no matter where I'm at, which is why I ended up in, you know, Skokie to check out, uh, you know, a bunch of those solid owls that were roosting there. And we actually did some pellet work and figured out what they were eating in that cemetery uh, as well. And uh, we've done some similar work with the solids uh, at Indiana Dunes. So what I really want to talk about tonight is about solid owls, uh, their migration through here, and the work that we've been doing at the Indiana Dunes National Park which is just, you know, a short, about an hour away for most folks, uh, especially if you get up early enough uh, to come visit. So this is uh, an opportunity to, that you can see this uh, in, in real person as well in October and November, and I'll tell you how if you have it. And it seems like every time that we're, we're greeting new visitors to the Indiana Dunes to watch our, our OWL program every year, new people raise their hand, hey, my first time, I... I guess you've been doing it for a while. It's the first time here. And it was like, where have you been? You know, we've been doing this for 10 years now. It's amazing how new people still learn about it every single year. But when I'm talking about a solid owl, as most folks know, it is, you know, the smallest owl in the Eastern United States. It's, uh, you know, just has like the elf owl and some of the pygmy owls out West that are smaller. But literally we're looking at a bird that's the size of a robin. And this bird, as we've discovered in its migration, never carries an iPhone on them. So we never know when they're coming. And so it makes some of this banding work so interesting because what it does is it gives uh, an identity to a bird. By putting a band on the bird, a nine digit number says, hey, you're Frank. And now if we see Frank somewhere else, we can actually know which bird that is rather than just another solid owl. And in case you've never seen a solid owl, here's a picture of one. This is a bird that suffers a disease. And, and I'm not talking about this one. I'm talking about every single individual of a northern solid owl. In fact, the entire Aegeolus genus has this disease. And what I call it, it's called the ugly disease. And it doesn't affect the bird per se, it affects us. And what it does is every time you see an image or the real thing, it makes you go, ooh, ah, that's, that's the actual symptoms of it. 
and these guys definitely have it. And, and, and it's such a tiny size, you know, they are a, a paromiscus killer. So they go and feast after deer and white-footed mice, and they're just their worst nightmare on the wintering ground where they might be roosting. But here, this is a, a typical look of what an adult might look like. Uh, to give you a size reference, here's another couple photos. Can you see a uh, lunch on the left there? Show you how small they are. As I mentioned, size of a robin. And I even have, I got one of these uh, new uh, iPhone uh, 13s and, and I got a, a digital scale that I happen to use while I'm uh, also uh, taking care of owls. And if I weigh this phone, my phone is 237 grams. The average saw it owl is 80 grams. So my phone is three times the weight of a saw it owl. If you happen to see one uh, in the winter time, this is probably what you see right there on the screen. And that is what they look like from four months of age to four years of age or even older. And so what they do is once they're born in the nest, say up in the UP or Northern Wisconsin, they will then uh, wear a different outfit. Then they go through a molt and that's about August, September, their first year of life. They go in the molt and they look like this. And that's the outfit that they'll wear the rest of their life. If you're lucky enough to see a baby solid owl or a juvenile before that molt, so go up to the UP or with Northern Wisconsin, call the tooting, find a territorial male, and you'll find some young ones. And they thought actually at one point that they were different owls. Uh, they were these really cinnamon owls. And so if you see a baby, this one's really inflicted with the disease right there. Definitely, ooh, ah. And it looks so different than the adults, but still looks, you, know, you start to see, you know, some of the features there and the eyebrows and such. But then once it goes through that first molt, you, you almost will never see this in Indiana or Illinois, because by the time the migration has begun, they're finishing up that molt. And so really just some of the northern banding stations, I heard somebody mentioned uh, Stevens Point, you know, they would have a chance of picking up a couple of these early in the season. But generally, once we get down here, we don't see them quite like that. Little 101 here on the saw owl, in case you're not familiar, but it is a uh, small, uh, generally eastern owl that uh, nests up in the boreal forest and in that transition zone. And then so you can see on that map, purple indicates year round. So that would also be breeding. And then as they migrate through, you would have down to the wintering grounds. And the wintering grounds on these, these maps you see, a lot of it comes from sightings. But now we have some of the banding data that really helps us to uh, really extrapolate and know more of what that wintering range is. And we actually have banding stations now in Georgia that people are saying, you're never going to get a solid owl. They don't go down that far. And the first year they opened up and they're catching half a dozen solid owls in a year just at one location. And so it really has opened up uh, more about the, the behavior and personalities and life histories of these really cool birds. But we do know north of us, they are secondary cavity nesters. 95% uh, of the diet is small mammals. I mentioned that pyromiscus, and that's that genus of deer mice or white-footed mice. So that's really primarily what they eat. And in fact, the, uh, I think it was a uh, uh, white-footed mouse is in that Skokie uh, cemetery was what they were eating a lot of uh, this last winter. And we know that a lot of ways that we study birds, Christmas bird counts and such, don't really work well because this is a secretive nocturnal bird. Uh, if you look at the records, even for Indiana, on average, 17 sightings a year in the last like 60, 70 years, 17 sightings a year. So that's extrapolated uh, by what, what Dr. Brock calls a bird record. And the bird record is, is, a, is a sighting of a bird at a location in a 10 day period, according to him. So you could have a wintering owl that's seen for like, you know, like 12 different weeks because it's wintering in the same spot and bird watchers are seeing it. And that's 12 of the 17 sightings for the year. So just it's not really seen that often. And so there's not a lot known about uh, not only, of course, the, the breeding of it, but in migration in the wintering time. In fact, if you take a look, this has just, just the first couple of years of our banding data when, when Ken produced this for us. But this was every record of a solid owl that's been found or early on was banded in Indiana dunes. And, and clearly uh, we're skewed because of some of our banding data, but you can see there's definitely a, a fall migration that teens the uh, peak right around Halloween. And then there's uh, wintering birds and then kind of a weak spring migration. And I think the spring migration is much more timed with weather and hormones. So as soon as that first thaw occurs, it tend to jet out and that can vary from year to year. So you're not gonna get quite the uh, bell curve on that histogram where the fall migration seems to be 
pretty timed every year. It occurs right about the same time. There's not a lot of fluctuation, uh, a little bit with some of the weather, but not quite like it is in the spring where migration uh, hormones are pushing a lot of these birds to get back to the breeding grounds. And you also see a couple summer records and, and there was historically breeding records in uh, Northern Indiana, Northern Illinois as well. A lot of those haven't occurred in 50 to 100 years. And, uh, but some of the most recent ones in the early 80s, we had some August sightings of, of an actual juvenile uh, saw it out. And so it begs the question, did it breed nearby or are they just a lot of wanderers that uh, goes on there? So why do we study them? First, I mentioned some of this is we just don't know a lot about them. Uh, just very little baseline data. We don't know a lot about what they do in the Midwest once they get down here. And it was assumed 10, maybe hundreds were migrating past Michigan and Wisconsin into Indiana uh, in any particular year. So that's why we belong to a group that's called Project Owlnet. Project Owlnet is a collaborative group of owl banding stations around the country in Canada that are doing things in the same procedures, same protocols, so that we can compare data across stations. We're using the same sorts of nets and such so that we can then actually share data uh, and then recaptures almost in real time through some of the you know, social network groups now as well. And because there are a lot of banding stations specifically targeting solid owls, we can get recaptures of upwards to 10% of these birds. We'll have their, that bird found with the band on it again, and then we can start to learn where they go. When you look at regular songbird uh, uh, migration and, and banding there, you're looking at less than 1% recapture rate. So you know, literally tenfold that because of Project Owlnet and the work they're able to do uh, primarily with solid owls, but they do work with some of the other owls too. I make a point of clarification. Uh, that photo, I am 100% sure, was faked. Uh, almost certainly from a banding station. I can see the little band on his uh, right uh, foot there. Uh, but uh, we, when we're not banding owls, and I saw John Devaney, one of our volunteers, on. I can he can also uh, verify we don't knit little hats for owls, and so I'm, I'm almost certain that was photoshopped on them. Here's where Project Owlnet operates. So this is a couple of years old now, but. Uh, you can see that it's really heavy in the Appalachians and then Southern Canada. And obviously where a lot of them are, are moving through in that mixed coniferous forest uh, coming out of the, uh, the boreal forest. Not a whole lot really particularly in our area until uh, of course when we established Indiana Dunes, it seemed like a great location right on that Southern tip of Lake Michigan. Here's how we do it. We use mist nets and I'm gonna, probably guessing that a lot of you guys that are on here tonight know what a mist net is. You've seen the bird banding nets, really similar to the same nets you'd use for songbirds. So they're about 30 feet long. What they, uh, the, the twist here is that instead of setting up at sunrise, we're setting up at sunset. So we then come out right as the sun is setting, we will unfurl these nets, stretch them out across the length of that pole vertically. So you're gonna go up about 12, uh, uh, about 15 feet in the air. And then there's a, uh, little pockets that are produced within that net. And each of these pockets, because of these trammel lines, allows a bird to fly through the forest. These nets, once they're opened up, become invisible. And so the bird will literally kind of hit that net, but what it does is it catches them, and then they fall into these little pockets, and their weight of them closes that with that trammel line and kind of keeps them inside there. And, and for the most part, they'll just kind of lay, and they don't move around too much and ready for us to come check the nets as we do every kind of 30 to 60 minutes through the, uh, the course of the evening. Now, how do we actually get them to the nets is a great question because uh, back in the 80s, they used to just set up these nets out in the woods and just kind of go back inside and then we'll, we'll cross our fingers and come out an hour and see if there's any owls in it. And that was really the standard of how it was done for many years. And uh, it was actually up in Northern Wisconsin that uh, one of the stations decided to play the call the broadcast call of the solid owl. Most of you guys are familiar, it's one of the most easiest birds to imitate. It's just that steady whistling tooting sound. Now, so we'll play that at a hundred decibels. And so obviously out there in the field, you can go through a lot of batteries and we've invested in these cool little things uh, that I'm holding here. It's called a, a Fox Pro and these things get charged up and they're super loud. And if I hit this button, you can probably start to hear it play. How loud it gets. 
at 100 decibels, it's literally screaming for a solid owl to come down in the woods and check it out. And that's really what happens is they then circle around and that's how they'll find that net. And they found that the, the first year that they started doing that, uh, we would see a tenfold increase in how many owls they, they were capturing using the audio lure. So that has then become the standard today that we use. And once that net is up, uh, we walk away, turn on the collar, and we come back every 30 to 60 minutes, hoping for uh, obviously a, a solid owl to be in there. If we get one, we will extract it from its from the net. And so basically we're going to kind of pull it out. We'll get the netting off of the wings. We get it off of the head. And of course, see the, the part that makes them real kind of uh, ornery pain in the butt sometimes is they like to grab it with their talons. So we got to pluck all the netting out of their talons. And then once we actually have them out, we can bring them inside for processing uh, at the Indiana Dunes Visitor Center. So we actually run nets uh, in several different locations that I'll show you here on the map uh, in a little bit. We're gonna collect some basic information on every solid owl that we process. So we're looking at things like wing cord. We're gonna be looking at, here's uh, looking at the, the, the bill or the, the Coleman length uh, that we're measuring. We also look at the eye color too. Is there some work being done uh, to see if we can age these birds uh, as well? There's that wing cord. So it looks like they're little torpedoes, doesn't it? We put that band on them. As I mentioned there's that nine digit USGS. This is a, the aluminum bird banding band that uh, is assigned to us by the bird banding lab. And that's what gives it the identity. And this is where it makes it, if you ever see a bird that's got a band on it, whether dead or alive, you can go to reportband.gov and you can enter in that band information and they'll give you a little certificate to tell you about what species it is, where it was banded, when it was banded. So you can get all kinds of cool information just from that band record if you happen to encounter one. Mention that wing, open that wing up there. You might see some different colors there on your screen. And this is why I think it's really fascinating is we can age a solid owl by looking at its wings. And as I'm looking at that wing, the, the darkest feathers that you see closest to the body, those, those secondary flight feathers are really dark. I see two, it looks like kind of a really light chocolate, uh, milk chocolate color to it. I see another dark one, then I see four lighter ones, and then it gets darker again. And what I'm seeing there is that new feathers are dark. Old feathers are that light brown. So this owl has old feathers that drew out a year ago, and then has newer feathers that just grew in in the last uh, season. And so by seeing that multiple ages, I know this isn't a hatch year bird that was born this year, all of the feathers would look the same if it was born this year. When you start seeing this broken pattern, this is the older type bird. So this bird here is probably three years or more just by looking at that. Longevity, uh, anyone want to guess? And go ahead and actually just throw it in the chat tonight and we'll answer it by the end. If you have a guess how old the oldest saw it out ever found with a band on it is. We'll answer that one here later. But one of the cool things that we do, in addition to opening these wings up, is that we can flip the bird over on the underside. And I don't know who figured it out, but someone, 70s, 60s, I'm guessing, discovered that if you turn on a black light on these owls, owls glow. And there is a uh, pigment called peripherin that's on these birds. And it's, it's kind of dusted on the underside of the wings. And it tends to degrade pretty fast and, and it'll degrade in sunlight. So owls are a great bird that retain it. And if you turn a black light on to an owl, their wings and the undersides that have this pigment glow bright cranberry pink. Pink owls, take a look at that. So there's black lights of the underside of a solid owl. And on that top one, uh, that's a young bird. Every single feather is new. So pink means new, it hasn't faded away yet. So it's just on the fresh new feathers. So that is a young bird. Every feather is brand new, but look at that bottom photo. There's an old bird. You got some old feathers, new feathers, old feathers, new feathers, old feathers, new feathers. So you really see that mixed pattern there. That bird again is probably three to four years old on it. And so it's kind of a really cool thing. I don't know who discovered it. Someone with a Pink Floyd poster somewhere, but it's a useful science that we're able to use today. 
And finally, we were able to take all of that information, and particularly here, the wing cord and the weight, and we can tell boys from girls because solid owls, like birds of prey, tend to have uh, where the females are a little bit bigger than the males, but that size difference is not gonna be visual on a small bird like a solid owl compared to, say, a bald eagle. You get a male and a female, they're pretty obvious. Uh, but here, we're able to take that wing cord, so we're measuring in millimeters and we're looking at that weight in grams. So generally anything that's going to be, uh, you know, in the about 85 and, and under tends to be a male and anything about 90 and over tends to be a female. And then we have this kind of in-between zone where the science isn't quite 100% confident. So we don't actually assign those uh, uh, a sex. I think this was asked uh, earlier. Somebody asked uh, other things that you encounter. When you're doing a, a project like this and you are out, you know, five nights a week for, for six to eight weeks, you tend to see a very <coughs> nocturnal animal that there is. And uh, over the years, I've run into everything from baby possums to mice to here flying squirrels. Bats are an issue in October, especially early in the season. There are migratory species. Uh, I think the, the ones I see most are, are the red bats as they're moving through. We keep uh, special gloves in our banding equipment so that when that does happen, they usually don't get too tangled up, just kind of a little bit of shaking of the net and they'll usually pop on out. And flying squirrels, um, I have yet to take a flying squirrel out of a bird banding net because as a rodent, they tend to use their incisors and help themselves out of my nets uh, rather than me get them out. And so we, uh, the number one uh, need for donations every year is, is fixing flying squirrel damage to our nets and replacing them. So they are not our friends out there. On a typical night uh, in Indiana Dunes when we're banding, we are running four different stations and about 13, 14 nets and each net is $200. So you can imagine my, my fear every night that a herd of deer will wander up to the banding station and, and shut us down for a while. Here's our success, believe it or not, we have in the last 10 years, We've banded over 600 owls that have come through one single location. We had a, a station early on, just as we were getting started, it was 2008. What we've seen is there's a four year cycle on these owls. 2008 was a big year, 2019 was a crash. We got to start on a crash here. 2008 was one of them super highs where one of our sites down in Southern Indiana at the Yellowwood uh, State Forest banded 450 owls in a single year. So really, we see uh, a stable population that fluctuates within a normal range. And this can occur rapidly uh, year to year. And a lot of it's based on prey. So it's a four-year cycle of the mice that they're feeding on. So as the mice spike up, they're able to breed a lot. And the next year, we see this crash occur. There's no hatchier birds, but we still see a lot of second-year birds. So we can see that pattern on them, that they were a baby last year. And so they came from last year's invasion. So our very first year, I was doing it from Dune State Park. We had one station, just four nets out there. And um, it was just me and this contraption I built. It was a, a car battery with a plywood box, MP3 player hooked up to it. We had a 300 watt amp and speakers and they put it on wheels for me. And it was 80 pounds. So I was able to pull it out to this, this woods that I had set up my nets. And I did that for about a week and, and wasn't getting any owls. This is the first first week of October. And, and then it rained about an inch. And I came back out there and the site was underwater. So I found that I was then pulling this 80 pound box through muck and back and forth every single night, I ended up doing like a wheelbarrow that I had it in. And I would kind of pull it that <laughs> type of muck to get it out to the spot. And uh, finally, I remember it was uh, October uh, 19th, uh, 2009 the very first solid owl was in the nets. And I called everybody up and said, hey, I got a solid owl. And so six or seven people joined me and we, we banded and processed the very first solid owl at the Indiana Dunes that was banded. And then the next night they were all back. And it came the next night and it came the next night. And, and, and they provided all sorts of assistance for me. And I was, wait a second, where were you guys the last week when I've been hauling this thing through the muck all alone? And they said, well, <laughs> we didn't think you'd actually get one. <laughs> and then I, you did. And so that kind of set it off from there. And 646 hours later in 13 years, it's, uh, it's amazing the data set that we've been able to collect and what we've been able to learn. Again, someone uh, 
uh, was looking at that, that Project Alnet uh, map earlier, but now we actually have extra assistance. In the last couple of years, we've been able to get some of the universities on board, and there's now a banding station at Purdue University in West Lafayette, and they also run one at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. So now we've set up this perfect area where we can intercept them as they're migrating along both sides of Lake Michigan, as they're dispersing through central Indiana, finally getting into like the Hoosier National Forest and more of the kind of traditional sites that we would think of them as banding. And then our other stations on the eastern end of the state, east of Indianapolis, you know, state line, and that's uh, our Mary Great Bird Sanctuary. And they've been banding there for about six or seven years as well. So it's really kind of adding this Indiana Project Owl network that we have. Our stations, should you come visit us, we actually run uh, four different sites, but most of them are all, all the banding is done out of the Indiana Dunes Visitor Center. So just outside the park at 49 and US 20 there. But we have uh, two sites within the, the Dunes State Park, uh, the West and East in there. And then we have the uh, Shirley Hines Land Trust Meadowbrook Nature Preserve, nine miles south next to the Moraine Nature Preserve. And if you know anything about the, the dune ecology of this area, those first dunes uh, that you climb, you know, are tough and sandy, 200 foot dunes, but the elevation actually climbs from the ancestral Lake Michigan behind there. And that's that Valpo Moraine area where it's actually uh, about 200, 250 feet higher in elevation than the Indiana dunes are. And so it gives us an extra little location that we can project that fall and intercept owls that might not be hugging directly on that lakefront. So kind of looking at his way we're, we're calling that. And, and we think the solid owls can hear that call about two miles away or even farther, especially if they're migrating in the air as, as we're calling them. What's been really uh, interesting is to see the recoveries. And so these are birds that we have banded that have been found at other locations or birds that have been banded at other locations that we have found with bands on them arriving at the Indiana Dunes. And it, it's no big surprise, we trade the most owls with uh, Northern Michigan and Northern Wisconsin. Whitefish Point is our number one partner for owl trading. They get a lot of ours, we get a lot of theirs. Typically, uh, uh, they come uh, from another banding season, spring or summer, but sometimes it's the same season, about a month later, we'll get it. Uh, they do a lot of banding up at the Straits of Mackinac too. We've gotten a few of Ed Pike's birds, and then Gene over at the, uh, 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 Stevens Point uh, we've gotten, but I think most remarkable for us at the Indiana Dunes was one of the birds that we first banded in 2009. And then in 2010, nearly a year later, that owl that we banded showed up at Isle de Haute in Acadia National Park, Maine. This isn't a bird that said, you know what, I'm out of here, 943 miles, I'm going to be like, this bird continued its migration south, wintered, came back up north to the breeding ground. And then this time in migration said, I'm not going that way and went due east. And literally, you know, if you know that aisle, that's offshore. This bird heard the, the calling and then came offshore and landed on that island and then fell in the net and they were able to read that band number and verify it was the same owl that came to the dunes. And we were gloating for, for quite a while now, what an amazing record that was. And, and then when Purdue went online, the very first year that they did it, they had to outdo us. And uh, this is what they got. They found the bird with a band on them that had been banded the same year up in central Saskatchewan. So we're looking like 1,100 miles. And so it surpassed our record. So we had no idea that the solid owl that could be migrating through Indiana came from you know, northern or central Saskatchewan. Such an amazing, amazing record. In fact, uh, Purdue, uh, as part of a paper they've been writing, was able to map out every single Indiana occurrence, whether it arrived in Indiana or was uh, recovered somewhere else. And you can kind of see them there. Uh, obviously, most of them just tend to come from probably they're, they're breeding in this belt right around Lake Superior on the north side there. Here is a stat that will stay the same no matter what year it is. Look at that. In any particular year, 70 to 80% of your owls that migrate through Indiana or Illinois are going to be females. You can, you can put money in the bank there, making that bet. 10% uh, are males, 
and that 10 to 15 percent are kind of those tweeners that we really don't know what they are usually the suspicion is they're just light hungry females and so they're just weighing a little low they don't quite weigh in as a as a female but we see that their measurements are more closer to a female than a male so it's more likely that about 80 five to 90% of them are probably females that come through here. So when we were looking at the, in the cemetery and I was joking, uh, um, I think it was with uh, uh, one of the fellows there and I said, yep, that's a girl there. He said, how do you know? I, said, well, <laughs> I just know. And if you do get a male, it's almost always gonna be a young male. You never get an adult male. And if you're an adult male, what you want most is to be able to breed next year. And so you need uh, a nice territory, you need a nice food supply, something to attract the mate with. And if you have this nice fat pad up in Northwoods, you can't leave because another male will slide in. So the males tend to have to stay up north, even though it's 50-50 in real life, males and females. Females, they can go to Florida, the mice are tan, taste great. You can enjoy the winter and the males stay up north. Now I mentioned those 10% that are males, they're hatchier because they're basically young males that don't have a territory yet. So it doesn't matter. Better chance of survival. Go south. Figure out finding your territory uh, when you need to in the spring. So most of the owls that come through are females. One of the things that we've done now for 10 years to be able to support the program is because of all of the equipment and then the, the nets that are constantly needing to be replaced. Uh, these, these, these collars that I use tonight, that's $350 and the batteries die on them, uh, is we do an adoption program. And that uh, allows folks to um, get in, uh, take home an owl and you get to have it for about two weeks and you got to bring it back. No, we don't. <laughs> you get a certificate though, and you'll get a photo of that bird. And uh, we're able to give you the band information. And then what we can do is we keep it all in a database. And we got this spreadsheet of every person that's adopted an owl. And if we ever get notified of an owl that's been found somewhere else, which if it happens, we're the ones that get told, then we're able to share that with folks that adopt an owl. So in a way, you, you sort of live vicariously through that owl, uh, through an owl adoption. And that's one of the ways that uh, folks that come and visit the banding station are able to uh, support and donate to the station each year. What's amazing now is with you know, over 600 of these birds, every one is different. You know, they look alike. You can always tell, you know, which ones are kind of the sweet angel, which ones are you know, the one that crapped on your shoulder before you let it go. And so it's, it's really neat to see just the, there, there are real personalities amongst individual birds. And I think, uh, you know, even Jeff in the cemetery saw different behaviors on, on who would roost where and, and what they tended to do uh, when they were sleeping. So if you ever uh, want to support our stations, there's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, we mentioned the, the adoptions. We, we have our own little gear and shirts and such and hoodies that come people uh, purchase that all goes back to support the program, helps us purchase the equipment. I got to spend about $200 just in batteries every year on all the rechargeables that we're constantly cycling through so we can keep going because on these November nights when it's 34 degrees and you're, you're just sapping through batteries really quick and and you're sapping through volunteers as well. So a lot of ways that, that people can come and donate, whether they're doing it financially or just bringing things uh, to the banding station. Ah, there's the shirts we got. We got a, a local artist, uh, Christina Kanowski, and she did our, our recent project down at uh, Sawit Design that, that we've been uh, loving the last year or so. Let me tell you one more thing though. This is something that, that we really haven't had a lot time to share uh, with, with folks of what we've just been started, but we're looking to expand it more in the upcoming fall. And so I'm already looking forward to, I'm writing grants right now for the fall 2020 owl banding season. It's only five months away, right guys? And we are looking to incorporate what is called MODIS. And if you've not heard of the MODIS network, MODIS I think is, is Latin for basically movement. And what it is, it's a series of these tracking stations, these radio telemetry stations that can be set up around the country, around the world, and they can then pick up these little tiny tags called MODIS tags that we can put on birds. And to, to date, a lot of the uses for this has been limited to battery size. But now as technology is getting better, we can put these on smaller and smaller things. They're putting MODIS tags on dragonflies. These things are so light that we can attach these things to different flying animals. And all it takes then 
is, a, is an animal with one of these modus tags on them. An example here, that Swainson's thrush, it's just probably wearing it as a little backpack right around the, its uh, belly. And then under the legs, it's got probably some harnesses to keep it on, a little dab of glue. And this thing is weighing less than um, you know a dime. And as this thing flies by, within 15 miles of any of these modus towers, it'll ping the tower. And then online in real time, we can learn where these birds are going. You don't have to recapture the bird. And so now we can let these guys fly around and we can start to pick up more than just point A and point B, we can get all the points in between. Now this isn't cheap, every modus tower is about five grand and we have um, the, the modus tags are about $200 a piece. So you know, if you're looking to put 20 tags on and learn where birds go, you can really figure out how the, the price adds up quickly. Uh, but uh, with the right grant, this is kind of the next wave of what we can do with our saw at all research to really continue where they're going. Because then not only can I learn where these birds are going uh, in, in more definitive terms, but then I can also look at how birds are staying in Indiana Dunes. By having a tower here, we can see how long he actually stayed until it left. And then with the use of, um, I think I got a photo of it here. Yeah, on the right there, you see that is a handheld antenna. And we did a uh, kind of a, a test run last year. We got about 10 of these tags from a grant. We, we didn't have the tower yet on the left, but we had one of these handhelds and we were putting these things on owls last year in November and finding that we would come back to the banding station the next day. And it's like, you know, three or four in the afternoon, we're not gonna start for a couple hours. We turn on that antenna and there's three owls pinging the antenna that are within a quarter mile. And then we can actually track them and we're finding the actual roost locations that the owls are choosing. Boy, the, 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 the old stories of you gotta go to a pine tree to find a solid owl, man. I tell you, bush honeysuckle, sumac trees, oak trees, they're everywhere. And I had some of these owls, there was one in an oak tree and I'm waving this antenna and it's basically screaming at me, the owl's right there, right there. And I'm pointing this up there and I realize that the tip of my antenna is about 10 inches from the bird because they're so well blended in that I'm just, where the heck is it? And then I realized that he's looking at me going, what are you doing? I backed up and got out of there. And so it's really cool what we can start to do with MODIS technology. And that's really where we're hoping to expand. And, and right there, you can see there's a photo of an owl with the little antenna, little whip that just comes right out by the tail. And then it fits on as a really super light harness. It doesn't disturb the birds at all. It doesn't inhibit their flight. And then once that bird takes off, we're able to see uh, how long it sticks around in the Indiana dunes. And we have a better chance of pinging on another tower throughout its life. There's another example of a, a solid owl with a, a little tag on them. And just in one year down at our Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary, these are points that were produced in one year just by a couple owls by pinging past several towers. So we had one that actually did a whole network of um, towers around Fort Wayne. The Fort Wayne Children's Zoo has some and then went up to Michigan and a lot of them have shot in the Ontario. And so they didn't know these birds were going that direction. And if they weren't caught in another banding station, and most of the banding stations operate in the fall. So a good chance that a lot of these spring records would have never occurred if it weren't for the MODIS. This is an example. If you go to modis.org, you can actually look up projects. You can look up receivers. And uh, this is an example of the Mary Gray station, all the tags that we have deployed there. And then you see these kind of histograms, remind you of something from eBird. And so in this particular case, we had Northern Solid Owl 37431 that uh, was banded in November, but you can see it kind of continued on. And even one of them, uh, uh, 37432, uh, was banded early in the season and actually continued on to Mary Gray until December 21st, this last uh, year. And then after, uh, it looks like that would be about 11 a.m. on the 21st, uh, she disappeared. So we don't know if it migrated out, got in some area, just finally got away from enough from the tower and uh, hadn't appeared again. But obviously we are checking these now to check our different towers to see if they're pinging because our tower will help our project, but we're also helping other projects. So anyone else that tags a bird, we can help contribute to their data by having it ping past our tower, which is hooked up online to the network. So if uh, somebody's, uh, somebody's wimbrel happens to fly by the dunes uh, with a tag on it, we can help out with that research. And the last thing I'm gonna mention that we've been doing, check this out. We took a couple as an experiment last year, got our permits in a row, and we began 
tracking juvenile dispersal of the eastern whippoorwill population in the Indiana Dunes. And here you can see uh, Libby had uh, banded one. You can see the little whip coming out of its tail on a, uh, and that's a, not an egg, that's a full moon behind it when she took that photo. So we were able to put just a couple of these out last year. We, we, we've learned what we're doing now. So uh, we know how to capture uh, these little boogers. So we're heading back out there again this season and we're hoping to expand that. And that'll show us uh, not only uh, how, how long these young and, and juveniles are sticking around in the dunes, because we know they stopped calling in August, September, uh, but then what's their habitat use? Do they move into more of the oak savannas? Will they go into the deeper habitat? And so by having that handheld remote, we can actually track them during the day and figure out where they're spending their time. There's so much that we can do here with this MODIS uh, network. And there's an example of a, a MODIS tag on a whippoorwill. And if you're curious, there's just a little screenshot from yesterday. Uh, and this shows every MODIS tower that's been installed so far. And um, obviously, uh, uh, Bird, uh, Bird Study Canada, they've got their act together. They've been doing tons of them. Uh, if you know uh, where Long Point Bird Observatory is on North Shore there, uh, amazing collection there. And actually in Pennsylvania, they put up what, what we call a fence. So it's a whole row of them. So basically this was set up for Scott Widensaw's solid owl banding project in Pennsylvania. So if a solid owl moves through Pennsylvania with a MODIS tag, it can't go by without getting detected. It has a fence and that's been proposed uh, here for Indiana as well, stretching near the Indy area down towards Goose Pond. There's uh, dreams to put up a MODIS fence uh, for our state. You do see one there in uh, uh, right there at the state line with Indiana, and that's, uh, I believe that's a uh, big marsh. And uh, I know uh, Stephanie Bilkey with uh, uh, Audubon Great Lakes helped to uh, get that tower up. And that was just put up this fall. Ours got put up uh, this fall as well. So now we are both online and ready to record birds coming by. So if you want to uh, see solid owl banding, uh, we band every Thursday through Sunday. This is in October through November. It's at the Indiana Dunes Visitor Center. If you go to indianaaudubon.org slash events, you will actually see a little sign up and we actually offer registration every single night. You can kind of pick your night you want to come and just hang out and you watch the banding. You'll learn about it. We have a campfire, lawn chairs, because they go out every hour, check the nets. So you never know if you're going to get an owl on any particular night, but we tend to can kind of predict like a forecast what the best nights look like. Um, and so you can kind of pick the nights, usually generating around October 10th through about November 20th. Here's a secret. If you want the best chance of seeing an owl, plan for Halloween. We know that's about the statistical peak of the, the migration. So what a perfect Halloween thing to do. So grab your costume, come on out, hang out with us at the Dunes Visitor Center uh, there the first week of November if you really want to get a chance to see an owl. Some of our busiest nights, uh, not uh, 21, but in 2020, uh, when we were all locked down on, on COVID, we had this great night in October where I think we had 41 owls in a single night. And we were just you know, ringing and flinging owls. And it was one of those quiet Thursday nights. We weren't expecting it. Nobody was here. And literally, we had nobody here to watch this amazing sight that occurred. And then I'm sure we had you know 100 people ready the next night. And we had no owls. But uh, that's <laughs> how it goes uh, with these owls. And if you want to support the program, uh, we got a lot of folks that do it individually through the adoptions, or sometimes they want to adopt the MODIS owl. They want to pay the $200 for that tag, and then they can actually go online and watch and see where that owl gets recorded at. And so there's a couple of ways if you want to do that through indianaaudubon.org slash events or indianaaudubon.org slash donate. And that's the fun we've been having over at the Indiana Dunes with uh, solid owls for the last couple of years. Uh, and it's a lot of information and it probably uh, generates a lot of questions too. So I am here for any questions you have and uh, feel free to fire away. Thank you, Brad. That was amazing. And uh, I don't know that there's probably not an easy way of figuring this out, but I'm interested in, I guess, maybe, if, well, if you're on camera, raise your hand if you've ever seen a solid owl. <laughs> <laughs> not too many people on, on camera, so I can't really tell. Okay. Um, some of the questions in the chat were already answered. Uh, I think Francine asked, do bats avoid nets? And John said, no, they're caught. And I think you also talked about that, Brad. So if they're caught, you don't do anything with them. You just let them go, right? Nope, generally, yeah, we just let them go. Um, yeah. And the flying squirrels, 
you said they they, they let themselves that. go yeah i had maureen more, asked if running the trammel have, line once but yeah they get away do you have cameras on the nets too we have attempted this um so there were a couple of years where we wanted to put up trail cameras and we thought, you know, we would really like to witness this occurring and see, you know, the moment an owl comes and hits the net, does it fight a lot, does it struggle, does it lay there? We tried setting that up and what we found was that it happened so fast that by time, because you're in the middle of the dark, and so by time the sensor kicked off, it was set to uh, instantly take a quick picture and turn on the video at the same time. And so the few times that we got it, and I was seen like this, and it was already kind of hanging in the net. And so we never were able to capture it that way. And because of the remoteness of the sites, we really don't have a, a continuous power supply and we don't have an internet connection either. So it's really, we, you know, the other alternative would be to try to stream something. And so that's just been kind of prohibitive at the moment. Uh, we did find one year that we did have the cameras up that we had first turned on the nets and turned everything up and we'd walked out. And then about 30 minutes later, from a nearby picnic area, uh, two guys come walking into our banding station. And we see them walk past the camera. It clicks on the video and it's recording them. And, and they're kind of looking at this caller that's playing really loud. And, and I see the one guy go and he turns it down and they go walking away. And as they're walking away, they're speaking in Russian. We can hear it in the video right past the camera. And obviously Indiana Dunes State Park, you get a lot of tourists from all over you know, the world that are there. And, um, and we didn't realize it. And then our volunteers that went in the next hour said, gosh, it seemed kind of quiet. We turned it up. And it wasn't until the next day that we actually saw the video that, that basically our station got hacked by Russians that night. And, uh, but we were able to recover, get our callers back and uh, keep playing for hours that night. But that, that's our experience with cameras. Yeah, that's quite a story. <laughs> um, okay, we have, we, I guess maybe at the end of this, we'll ask about the oldest owl, which you mentioned before. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cindy asked, where did the name of the, the bird come from, Sawat Owl? <laughs> there's, there's several stories on the name of the Sawat Owl, and, and one of them that, that I've heard a lot has uh, describes the, the kind of a call that they give, and uh, it's been described at, by, most notably, John James Audubon heard it uh, at his uh, lumber mill, and said it sounded like the, the sharpening of a saw or that whetstone, you have heard that before, hence the name saw wet. The problem with that is at this mill where Audubon was in, in that June was out of the breeding range for saw wet owls. And if you also consider what we also know about John James Audubon was that he was an enormous liar, that it probably wasn't true. And, but we got another story and this occurs more up in the breeding grounds of Quebec. And it turns out that the French word for little owl is chouette. And so my idea is that the, the translation from French to English uh, to settlers of the chouette or chouette owl probably got changed somehow to sawwet owl. And that is probably more likely the, the definition of where it got its name rather than, than Audubon hearing it and liking it to the, the wetting of a, of a, or the whetstone and the sharpening of a blade. Forever a mystery, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, Ellen asked, does the phase of the moon influence the number of owls you catch with the nets more with moonlight or vice versa? Absolutely. So it, the perfect owl migration conditions are one of a couple conditions. We want, uh, we want cold, we want calm, we want clear skies. This typically happens after a front has come through. It's been really rainy, uh, and then it gets really cold the next day, the wind, north winds have come, and then finally that next day of the night, the winds have died down, the skies have cleared, it's usually a little colder after the fronts come through. That is perfect migration conditions for a solid owl. Leading up to that in south winds, we don't get many owls, but as soon as that front comes through, it opens up the cork and owls come flowing through. Now you asked about the moon phase, how it affects things, is that actually owls, they're, they're pretty active in that full moon period. They have to watch out for predators when they're migrating, but owls are generally active, except for if an owl can see my net, hence a bright full moon, uh, they're not gonna hit it. We've had stories from down in Yellowwood where they walk in on a full moon night and owls are perched on top of the nets. <laughs> if they can physically see at the perch, you're not gonna capture them. Okay. And so how that occurs, so that you get a full moon shining on the nets after the leaves have fallen. 
So if it's in October, when we're still in the, the blaze of fall color, the full moon generally doesn't affect us that much. But once the leaves have dropped, a full moon in November tends to hurt us. And so see how it kind of changes with the season on what moon phase that you actually have. And so, and then we know cloudy skies tend to not get as many owls. So I guess it doesn't really help there if it washes out the moon. So our secret with one of our stations, you band under a pine stand. Then it doesn't matter uh, what month it is. We tend to have the shade from the, the moon no matter what uh, when we're under there. But some of our other sites don't have that luxury and they get that pretty bright in November on a full moon night and don't capture as many owls. Um, interesting. Um, I think that was the last question. Cindy said she likes the French name better. <laughs> um, well, so we want to maybe uh, just quickly talk, and you, I was going to ask you when your uh, banding is, but you anticipated me, so that was good, when your banding program is. Um, okay, oldest owl, so. <laughs> yes, yes, so uh, in the course of our banding at the Indian Dunes, we've been lucky to get some that have been quite a few years old. We don't just ban solids, we've actually captured uh, screech owls from time to time. There's a territorial owl that we see out there that they don't seem to mind the solids that are moving through. Uh, we've actually caught barred owls too, uh, a few of those in the years uh, that folks have gotten to see us banned. Uh, and the, the record for the oldest solid owl that was had a USGS bird band on it, found later, uh, was nine and a half years. Wow. So generally not as old as you might think, compare that to like a great horned owl, and that's 28 years, the oldest great horned owl. So it's uh, not quite as old as the other ones, but uh, you know, they're tough little guys and gals. Uh, so nine and a half years for, uh, yeah, so that you banded nine and a half years ago, so you could have banded it at hatch year or something, right? So, so at nine and a half, so yeah, so what it means is that we, so here, here's the secret. Oh, you've aged the owl. Yeah, so as we were able to age the bird, and for birds, all birds have the birthday on the same day. Really easy to remember, you got a bird, celebrate it on January 1st. Because that's the, that's the date that they go from their hatch year to the second year of their life. So that's actually how we age birds. And so the assuming that these certain dates and we ban them, that's how we were able to guess their age. So I guess we'll do, this is the last question. This came through just as you were saying, competition right. from screech owls. Ken, Ken Click asked, how about competition from screech owls? Do you know if there are territorial disputes? Sure. Um, We've never seen any, but we do know that when we are playing our solid owl call that every season we tend to catch uh, this one screech owl about twice a year. And so he's flying around, he first, first hears that call and he's kind of wondering what's going on. There's this loud tooting in my territory. And then he figures out it's just us and he tends to leave us alone for the rest of the season. Uh, but we are ever conscious of things going on around the nets because we don't want predation. We have uh, amazingly, in, in, in 13 years, we have never lost a solid owl to a predator. And most stations will have that happen to them at one point. And uh, those include barred owls. And a barred owl will come and take your owl right out of the net and won't do it as gentle as we do it. So if we hear predators uh, like barred owls hooting near the nets, we shut everything down, we stop. Because um, everything really, all the science and everything that we're able to do for the research and the education, the owl still is the most important thing, and that's what really rides on our, our permitting as well with the bird banding lab that uh, we put the owl's uh, importance first. <laughs> okay, one more, one, sorry. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, uh, what we do to prevent the spread of avian okay. flu, and obviously we're not really addressing that at the moment since this is in the fall, but we are have other projects where we are talking about that, and uh, I have one of the other projects I do is I'm the, the Northern Indiana Peregrine Bander. And so I have a procedure now that I have to follow as far as disinfecting uh, all the banding equipment between bandings, even you know changing my clothes between bandings, Lysol. So there's things that I'm having to do now in between each of these. And so we would probably be, my guess, instituting probably some sort of cleaning tub where if we're banding owls, we're only doing one at a time, and then we're cleaning equipment between each of the bandings. One of the things that we don't have to worry about as much is if we were, sorry, if we were doing uh, banding with songbirds, uh, where you're actually attracting them off into a feeder, that's more of the concern with banding, is, is we have a lot of birds that we're bringing in together through that feeding process, where passive mist netting in general, the birds are far apart, not really interacting. So as long as you're doing your job at the banding station to keep things clean, then that practice in itself inherently isn't as risky to the birds. 
that makes sense. I'm going to allow myself the last question and then yeah. will anybody, everybody can unmute themselves and say goodbye. This is, I was just wondering about the whippoorwill uh, banding okay. because you said you capture juveniles and you know, there's also adults around. So are you selective or are you lucky? <laughs> no, we're banding them all, but our, our primary interest is, is watching and see what the juveniles do. Okay. Um, we we're going to ban the adults too. And, and technically when you're considering you know, the, the most baby birds, you know, a lot of them die every year. Something like, what, like a third or something or two thirds won't make it the first year. So some people say, oh, if you put all those modus tags on young birds, you might as well just throw them in the garbage. Most of those aren't going to make it, right? Uh -huh. so the adults, where they, they're going to live longer and you got a better chance to get some data. But we want to get that information from all of them. So we start first in the season with the adults. That helps us learn the territories. So then we can then target them later, a month, month or so later. I see start banning the juveniles once they're moving around. If we could find a test, that would be great, but you know, those, those are hard to find. All right, well, we have spent, uh, taken a lot of your time. I appreciate it. If you, Sunny, want to unmute everybody. And um, thank you so much, Brad. It was fascinating. And I, I know a few people couldn't sign on. So thank you for letting us record so that we can get them the recording. Um, and, uh, Really appreciate it. I'm glad I ran into you in the cemetery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. The, the better situation is to meet at a cemetery. Oh, hey, Mary Lou. Thank you. Good to see you, Mary Lou. Thank Thanks. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Very nice. Thank you. you. Great, great program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good Thank night, you. everyone. Good night, everybody. See you in May and then in person in August, I hope. <laughs> And to those who are seeing this on time delay, as I enter the, end this recording, uh, my apologies. We'll get the link to you. Great. Yeah, I have I have a, a few people. You thanks, Brad. Yep, thanks. Have a great night. Yeah, thank Bye. you. We'll be Bye. in touch. Thank thanks you. again. Okay, Excellent. good night, everyone. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting, okay? Yeah, thank okay. you.